Yeah, good good morning, everyone. Um, Jennifer, just a quick note. You might be good not to use the mic. I think the mic is actually giving us an additional, uh, I think we can, we might be able to hear you without it. Do you mind saying something pretty quickly? Uh, it, is this better? Can you hear me okay online? Absolutely, okay. that's perfect. So perfect. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining this morning. Uh, sorry I'm not in the same space as you all, but uh, just excited to be able to talk with you all about um, artificial intelligence and the way in which it's moving across university campuses and the way in which we as faculty uh, might be able to lean in and support students. Uh, so thanks for being here and excited to jump right in with you all. Okay, we're gonna go to introductions now. So we'll do, um, let's do the online folks first. And so I'm gonna call on the online folks. So if you're just introducing your unit and what you do or what you teach, here at AU. So um, I'm just going to call up a few of your names. So first up is uh, Danielle Sadani. Hi, everyone. Danielle Sadani from the School of Education Institute for Innovation and Education. Um, and we work mostly with in service teachers in DC schools. <laughs> Next, I'm going to go to Robert Stokes. Robert may have just connected to the audience. So let me go to Josie Hunter. Oh, I think some folks might not be able to introduce online instruction. Um, let's see. Kat, how about Kat Buster? 
Hello, I'm Katarina Vesta. I teach in the uh, in CIS in the American Studies program, and I uh, have not used AI in the classroom before. Welcome, Hannah. Uh, let's go to Hannah Park. Hi, hello. My name is Hannah Park. I'm the education librarian at AU, um, and I support all education research related needs across the university. So I help students beyond School of Ed, actually. There's a lot of people interested in education. If you could turn off the mic, that would be helpful. If there's still a slight reverb, I, like, I, I think we could hear you fine without the mic. Thanks. Oh, maybe I Uh, yes, I'm a director of the uh, Graduate Human Resource Analytics Program, and I'm just uh, getting into using AI. Wonderful. Welcome. Uh, Jeremy Hunter, how about you? Okay. Let's, um, Katrine is our online facilitator from CPRL. So let's now, I'm going to turn it to the audience, uh, the in-person audience, and we'll, we'll just Start in the front with Luis, and then we'll just kind of like work our way zigzag. Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Alvarado. I'm a director of learning design, part of the Office of Graduate and Professional Studies. So a lot of intersection uh, and interest to to uh, for this particular technology. So I'm excited to be here. Good morning. Uh, I'm Walter Park, a CAS. Uh, I'm an economist. I teach a PhD, a PhD level macro course. My research is in on intellectual property. Welcome, Walter. Oh, I'm Mark, uh, first year instructor and advisor, so I teach AUX1 and AUX2. Hi, I'm Jason. Um, I'm from School of Education. I teach um, undergrad on education in emergencies. I also teach graduate students on edu well, education for international development for undergrad and education emergencies for Grad students, so just interested to learn how I can better maybe integrate AI policies in my courses. Hi, I'm Annie. I teach in the Writing Studies program, and I use Grammarly daily, so I guess I use AI daily. <laughs> yeah, you do, Annie. <laughs> Kelly Joyner, I'm the director of the Writing Studies program, so I teach daily. Um, yeah, AI is, is touching our field. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm the program coordinator for the Honors Program here in American. Um, I'm mostly just curious, but I'm also getting my master's degree in library science and digital archives, so AI is kind of really touching that. Uh, Tracy Weeks, professor of sociology, just trying to figure out where the lines are for how to encourage students to not make them over independent. Just to keep balance, Tracy, that's so true. Printed modern ability, communication, very similar. How it can be used as a tool without, you know. I'm Olivia Ivey. I work in the library. Um, and I am very motivated to know how people encounter information and how the information systems we create and encounter shape our ability to learn and be curious. Um, and obviously, wrenches have been thrown, so I'm, I'm here for it. Let me go. Awesome. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Regina Curran, I'm the Director of Cyber Policy in the Office of Information Technology. Um, so I'm really concerned with how we're using AI ethically uh, in line with university policy, how OIC can be supportive in that. Um, and then I'm actively engaged in conversations about turning on various AI tools at the enterprise level, such as AI for Zoom um, and other things. So if you have feedback on that, you're welcome. Oh, thank you for that, Regina. That's super helpful. Hi, Priya Doshi. I'm uh, Associate Dean of Faculty in the Office of the Provost. I'm also a uh, Senior Professor of Lecture in School Communications. So I'm interested in this both from institutional viewpoint, but also from my personal teaching interest, um, especially in the topic of how AI can be um, a starting point, potentially, for students from diverse backgrounds. Um, but I want to understand those lines as well. <clears throat> this, the phrase starting point for you really resonates with me. So I hope that we 
um, come back to that in our discussion. So let me see if I can go back to sharing the screen because Dr. Moss is going to walk us through um, and Dr. Moss is going to talk to us a little bit about School of Education and how we frame our work which intersects with this, this question today. Um, Dalton, does that look good? Can you see that? Yeah, it looks perfect. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I really appreciate the share out and folks making a connection to um, artificial intelligence and the questions that you are sitting with. Um, as we think about our SOE mission, um, our mission is really to create knowledge and prepare students to transform societies through education. And we think about AI, um, this tool that has this automation tool that these automation tools have, that have grown rapidly in our society we must ensure that our students are able to both understand the challenges and the opportunities that, that exist um, with artificial intelligence. So this sits squarely at the nexus of our mission at SOE. Um, when we think about um, our vision even at SOE, Jennifer, if you could go to the next slide, um, this, this also sits with it as well. Um, our vision really calls on us in the School of Education to think deeply about the local and national and international context in which education is actually happening and the way innovation actually occurs in terms of teaching, research, and service. And so when we think about our impact in terms of scholarship, talking about this issue is so important to our faculty. Uh, and so we're elevating it today. But our final commitment where this is uh, really hitting home for me is SOE's commitment to anti-racism. And when we think about being able to do three things we talk about in SOE, being able to disrupt, actively transform, and engage faculty, staff, and students. Um, this is what we're doing with you all today, particularly engaging faculty, staff, and students around um, history, critical self-awareness, and community involvement. When we think about automation, it's important to think about where we've been with automation. Uh, it's also important for us to think about the ways in which uh, we show up with automation. I heard you all talking about what you're sitting and grappling with now. Um, our own notions of how we did research, how innovation occurred in our time. It's important for us to, to think through that lens. And then the way in which um, the community is impacted by AI, the way in which information is received as a result uh, of these different opportunities. But you know, I, I say all that to say, um, our work at SOE is about analyzing self systems, mindsets, ideologies, practices, and policies to be able to dismantle white supremacy and anti-blackness. So as you walk through today's session, I want you to actively engage in analyzing self, analyze systems, even your mindsets and ideologies that you brought to this conversation, and most certainly your practices, which we'll talk about at the end. Uh, but I'll turn it back over to, well, actually I, I have the next slide, um, which is today's objectives. I'm trying to change the slides, let's see. Hold on, Chromebook, don't let me down. There we go. So when we think about the way in which we frame today's work, our objectives lean into the way in which SOE's mission, vision, and commitment to anti-racism <laughs> show up. Um, our first objective is, is really working in partnership with you to understand how generative AI works broadly and how it actually differs from our previous waves of workforce automation and how it's impacting social equality. Our second objective today is really grounded in looking at tools and resources that are being used across classrooms um, so that we can better understand how generative AI patterns actually work and the types of mistakes that can come about. So we'll share some tools with you today that are being used for a number of things so that you can think about the opportunities and challenges that exist with those tools. Finally, we want you to be able to sit in community uh, with folks who are in the room and who are on the Zoom and think deeply around um, AI-informed, discipline-specific pedagogy to support students in using AI for social equality. Um, so we've got some, some, some content here. We've got some resources that you'll be able to look at, analyze, think deeply about. And finally, we land in a place where we can talk to one another about how we move forward. Jennifer, I think it's back over to you. Thank you so much, Felton. So I'm going to do a very quick framework of what we mean by the title of today's presentation, Getting Real About Artificial Intelligence, because 
I think that we do have to be realistic that this is this is here and this is going to shape the workforce that our students are going to enter. So that means understanding that AI, because it is fast um, and does things quickly, creates challenges and opportunities. We have to think about how to do, how to make that equitable. Because if you're a delegator, it's a tool. If you're a delegate, it can uh, it can be a, a source of competition. We have to think about how to be adaptive, which means helping our students understand what AI is and how it works, so that they learn from it and outthink it, and learn how to leverage it. And then finally, um, we want we have to be leaders in higher ed in helping students create a more equitable and fair world in which AI is leveraged for good. That's really how we, what we mean by getting real. So we know that it plagiarism and it makes it hard to measure student skills if AI is doing work for them. So we have a measurement problem with AI. We have an intellectual property problem with AI, which is what the writer's strike and the actor's strike was about because AI predicts what you want to do next based on what everybody else has ever done in everything that's out there in the public domain. It's not exactly stealing their words or ideas, but it's using them to say, okay, what would a normal person do next? What would this look like? So it's, it's predictive. It's not thinking. It's predicting based on everything that's out there that has been created by human beings. Because of that, because it's predicting based on what's been created by human beings, it re reproduces human biases. And it has tons of inaccuracies because it doesn't have the logic of a simple child. It doesn't have any logic. It is simply predictive. Um, and then because it's fast, it can take work away from us. It can devalue the skills that we're teaching our students. We have to think, we have to think ahead. Um, I think pedagogically that we can teach with AI in powerful ways. So we can use it to help students read critically by reading how AI reads and understanding what AI gets wrong. We can have students use it for knowledge aggregation in a way that they might use it in Wikipedia, but only as a starting point, as Thea was saying, because AI gets is highly inaccurate and potentially biased. So it can be a way to gather information quickly, but it's never an end point. And finally, because AI models how humans write in many genres, it can teach genres to students, but it can we they can use it to learn genres of writing, but uh, but understanding that the genres are arbitrary. Genres are not fixed rules. They're they're arbitrary and they can be restrictive. So AI, this is just to say that AI does not have intelligence. But it doesn't really have intelligence. Intelligence puts a misnomer. So I asked it to come up with words that start with A that be innovative, and and it gave me three words that don't start with A. So, it, you know, a, a six-year-old wouldn't make that mistake. But at the same time, it generated this very quickly. It can read difficult texts very quickly and summarize them. But it misses what they're saying half the time. So we have to understand what it's good for and learn to think ahead of it and leverage it for what it can do. But we have to do this in a way that doesn't tear down ladders of opportunity. This is a broken ladder. So we have to help our students be leaders to leverage AI equitably, and learn to delegate work to humans in ways that may allow AI use, um, but really uplift humans and create equitable pathways to opportunity for people who may have been shut out of opportunity historically and also for humans as compared to machines. Okay, so that's kind of the framework of how we are thinking about it. Um, so let me turn this back to Moss <coughs> to just ask some kind of whole group <coughs> questions, just to hear a few thoughts about um, your experiences so far, Dr. Moss. Um, so I, I hope you were able to, to to get some insight into what we mean by real, um, because we have two questions that we want you to to really engage around, um, just whole group. Um, so we won't go into breakout rooms or anything, but the first question um, that we'd like to do is, is take an opportunity to learn from the room around how are you currently engaging students in discussion around opportunities and challenges? 
posed by AI and how have these discussions during instruction helped students transform their way of being, acting and doing? So we'd love to hear from um, Jennifer, I believe we said uh, two, to, two to four folks in the room um, and, and you can respond to either of the two questions, but we'd love to hear how are you actually engaging students in discussions around AI? up for people's thoughts, perspectives, and experiences here. Uh, Jennifer, uh, hello everyone in Zoom. Uh, so I don't have the, the honor of teaching any courses, but I do support a lot of faculty members who do, and I have the privilege of supporting uh, the School of Education as well. But as far as discussions, I think it's so easy to get caught up with artificial intelligence that you don't realize that there's an opportunity to be more humanistic in our approach. And for me, since I, I mostly deal with online learning, hybrid learning, you know, uh, digital technologies, I'm always very cognizant of how presence can be really impactful. And I think with uh, artificial intelligence, it's really good at the root sorts of assessments. And so I always advise faculty members to think differently, that's always great with this, but uh, broadly about assessments. You know, are we still, you know, doing long form essays or long form writing? There's more, more opportunities to have just authentic, real, short conversations as forms of assessments. And again, you're also connecting with your students. You're having more presence and you're also sort of curbing the influence of AI within your course. Not that you should feel like you should go against it. It's not, a, you know, antagonistic, but, it, you know, there are so many opportunities for us to be more humanistic with our approach to education that uh, I'm, I'm diving into that opportunity. Yeah, thinking differently about how we assess. Thank you, Louise. Other experiences, perspectives in the room or online? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I know for, I think you may have tried that didn't work or that you no, thought about trying, but it's free to try. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm actually a student, oh, that's right. so yeah. this is well, a different sure. perspective. I'm Samantha. Um, I'm a graduate student, and one of my professors last fall, we had a lot of long papers, and he was like, well, I know some of you might use ChatGPT or AI, and here's my challenge to you. If you're going to use it, use it sparingly enough that like I won't be able to detect or figure out that you're using it. So, but if he did figure it out, then he's going to, like, talk to you about it. So, I don't know. Like, it was kind of like do it at your own risk kind <laughs> of a thing. Um, so, I don't know. It, I feel like it was at least acknowledging that people are going to be tempted to turn to it and not acting like it's not even in the room. Did you, and <laughs> in your how did you think? Well, I mostly kind of, like, yesterday some of the students were talking about using it kind of almost like, uh, summary kind of a tool. So I was kind of using it like that for some of the things I was writing about, kind of just gleaning a little bit more background information, almost more like a Google kind of a thing. And then if I wanted to use like certain small phrases from it or words that I thought were helpful, then I would just sort of lift that little part. But it wouldn't like take the whole thing. Yeah, it, it is. Samantha, thank you for that, because it raises questions about intellectual property. It's not a human that wrote whatever you're writing, but it's also not you. And so if you're passing it off as this is how I write, then you're lying. But at the same time, you're not stealing somebody else's words. You're stealing the pattern of how human beings communicate in English um, online. Oh, Bridget, and then yeah, one of the things that I started doing um, in fall semester is I said, you can use AI, but you have to show me your work. And you can use AI as a brainstorm. So show me what you put into AI, and then show me what you spit out. And you do have to rewrite it in your own voice. Because I don't know if the rest of you have found this. Like, I find that like AI spits out in a voice that is not representative of that student. And for you know artists, it's so important that you're authentic. And so I make that argument. I'm curious, though, in terms of, you know, um, bias framings that get, you know, kind of, you know, uh, really bundled into all of this. This is also something that how do we talk to our students about, like, these, you know, unconscious biases that are being duplicated by AI. That's what I'm really worried about. Absolutely. And then I saw Tracy. Yeah. 
I mean, I guess I'm, I've been trying to think about it as a method, right? So to get students in the way that when I teach quantitative methods, it's like I put these variables in this data, I use this program, and I and this is my result, right? So they're very transparent about how they're using these tools quantitatively. So this is just the sort of application into a new domain. And so I'm trying to think about do those same requirements that we use quantitatively do so. These are the variables I put in my text. They interpreted it so that there's a there's so now I'm experimenting in just research uh, papers with a whole method section that includes all of those kinds of things. That for some I mean we've been doing this with whether it's electronic databases or you know like that that we haven't required the same kind of sort of transparency around it. So that's where I'm trying to think is that a way to help because then I can interrupt the method. Right? Like, Absolutely. It's, it's replicable if they if they can say exactly what they did. It's somewhat replicable. Well, right. well, um, Walter, and then so ask Walter the final comment on this and then we'll move on to this. I just wanted to make a comment about you know the, the biasness, and the question is who's worse, a human or a machine? And because when I when, when we look at the world of sports, say tennis for example, human beings make human referees make lots of mistakes, whereas a video replay shows that no football was in was in that. And so I know we're not there yet because of all the flaws you still mentioned, but I, I don't look for AI to be kind of a a neutral source, for example, we talk about, I talk about sports referees, but in, among academics, journal referees are also very biased. And we, uh, we would hope that one day that, that they could distill and, and, and come up with a, a, a better way. So I'm really comparing, when we criticize AI, I think we should be asking, you know, who's worse, you know, AI or the human <laughs> being? And that's an empirical question. It's an empirical question that varies depending on the probably depending on the input and the tool and modernization of the, the current state of the tools, I think you can raising that. Um, so speaking of tools, let me hand it back to Dr. Moss to talk about um, the tools that we can be that we can bring into this collaboration. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah, Jennifer. You so much. There are a couple of pieces that I want to elevate from the discussion. And one, it's the forwardness that everyone was talking about. Um, and I want to really hang my head around this notion of interrupting the method. Um, I, I really like that language. And I believe that interrupting the method also still has a commitment to these ladders of opportunity that we talked about earlier in the session. And I believe the notion of interrupting the method is about first understanding the tool um, that is being used. Uh, and so I think it's important if we're going to interrupt the method today for us to understand the different tools that are out there uh, that the folks are using. And I want to say one other point. I wanted to jump in your conversation. Um, we see AI for sure as a starting point. But I often tell people who are trying to fight back on the skill measurement portion when we talk about challenges with AI, that a strong rubric is your best friend, right? So if we have really great rubrics that really define tasks, um, it makes it extremely difficult for a student to use AI to get that task to 100%. And so in the spirit of, of really um, using it as a starting point, I think we have to get really good at making strong rubrics so that students can only use these tools that I'm about to talk about as starting points. So there are five areas uh, in education um, that we see broadly where folks are using folks are using AI in education. One is around content creation. And so it appears to be one of the most common ways that folks are doing it with chat GPT coming to the top of tools that folks are actually using. And folks are actually using that for general scripting and content generation. You saw earlier that Jennifer used it um, to try to find some terms, and you saw some of the inaccuracies that we talked about um, earlier coming about. I think the second way in terms of content creation is around image generation, um, which is really interesting. I was working on a project 
um, of an issue that was happening in Florida. And we actually took an image. Uh, we actually told AI, here's the original image. We want you to um, remove the student basis from this. And AI was able to do that in such a way that we could use the image and not um, violate FERPA in any way. And so that is one tool called um, DAL-E. There's another one called well, well Said Labs. And this is really interesting because qualitative researchers are using this a good bit. Um, it's for really creating text to speech um, voiceovers for video or images. Um, and so if you're asking students to develop some type of audio, uh, they might be using Well Said Labs. Uh, and Synthesasia is for creating actual video. Um, we've seen this actually happen in Congress where folks have actually taken previous speeches from members of Congress and used Synthesia to actually make brand new videos. And that is all through AI. So as you are thinking in your classroom around opportunities and challenges associated with content creation, I want you to think about the challenges that exist with these four tools that I've provided you with, but I also want you to think about what are the opportunities for creating a starting point. Uh, the second area uh, that folks are using um, artificial intelligence in is brainstorming and ideation. And you'll notice that ChatGPT uh, has come to the top again for brainstorming and providing feedback on ideas. As you think about opportunities and challenges, one of the ways that I've talked with students around using ChatGPT is once you've matured a set of ideas, drop those over into chat GPT and get feedback. So in the absence of having a partner, and, and this is a challenge for those of us who are concerned about AI from a humanistic standpoint, you are able to actually find a partner to do some of the work with you and give you some of the feedback. Um, so students, let AI give you the feedback before I give you the feedback, right? So that your work can be as tight as possible when it's coming to me. Um, so there's a program called Claude. Um, that's really about um, being able to get feedback on existing content. It actually goes further than chat GPT, uh, but it is, again, another tool that students can use for feedback. Jennifer, can you go to three and four? Um, um, you know, this is the one that gets really interesting for me is number three. Um, the one grounded in research uh, and analysis. Um, one, because I have my own bias uh, com coming into this, but what we've seen over the last year or so um, is that folks are actually using more of these tools for research, particularly around qualitative and quantitative data to really analyze and implement it. I've got a doc student who uh, is working on her dissertation and she wanted to put all of her, all of her, she wanted to put all of her interviews in AI and ask it to generate themes for her. But we did it, um, and we found inaccuracies in it, right? But it also became a starting point uh, for the work that you actually see. Um, and so ChatGPT does this: a program called Bing and a program called Bard. Um, and these are the big tools so far that people are actually putting <laughs> real data sets into. And, and using it for their work. We elevate these uh, tools today. Um, I heard a couple of you say in the room that you work with doc students. Doc students who are going to use these tools. I think we've just gotta be forward with them as we talked about earlier, and we've gotta be able to interrupt the method, right? Uh, and get them to talk about what actually happened when you use the AI tool, the way in which it did or did not represent the data. Uh, which is what um, I had an opportunity to do with my student. Uh, number four is around writing and communicating. Um, Smart Cat uh, is really interesting. It does translations. Uh, I've actually used it. Um, the translations are about 90%. Um, I tried it out just for this presentation. I had never heard of it before this presentation. Um, but 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 it does translate thinking for folks. Now, what we see a lot of folks actually doing this and using this for is to to mimic their own writing. Um, in things like Smart Cat and Chat GPT, you have an ability to say, write this like Felton Moss would write it. And so what it does is it goes out and it finds everything that you've written 
And it takes this new set of ideas and it translates it um, into the way in which you would speak. And so earlier we talked about some of the human biases. It's actually really concerning for me that we've got a system that's trying to replicate the way in which I've written in the past. Um, but it's, it's actually possible to do. It's, it's not as strong. Um, I was working on something um, for another organization that I work with, and I asked AI to say or to come up with a response to a problem based on how I've written in the past. And it went and took everything that I've written in the past and it developed a response for me. Uh, and it was about 90% in terms of accuracy, um, which was concerning for me. So I do want us to understand <laughs> that there are tools out there that are able to translate our original thinking. Um, and number five, uh, and this is where I pull, this is the last one. Um, you see chat GPT raises to the top again, comes to the top again, but there's another program called Fathom AI. And I actually want to encourage those of us who are doing research to use this. It's actually a tool inside of Zoom. Um, and I'm working on a study right now. And we actually use Fathom AI to actually transcribe some of the interviews after we end. So you actually it's a tool that you can put inside um, of Zoom that when you're doing interviews, it will actually um, give you a summary of the interview. It'll give you some of the things have interactions. Um, it'll tell you to how many times uh, during an interview a certain idea actually came up. Um, so I think when we talk about some of the challenges we raised earlier around skill measurement that Jennifer talked about, the human uh, bias that is associated um, with AI, the inaccuracies that come about, bias reproduction, and also skill um, devaluation. These are five tools that we should be thinking about um, about because these are the ways in which they can threaten our work. So I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague, uh, Jennifer, who's going to engage you in deeper discussion around um, these five opportunities and challenges um, when it comes to the, to the AI threat. Thank you so much, Felton. So um, it's really the breadth of tools that are out there is, interesting and kind of intimidating just as you said because they do different things and everyone has each one has strengths and weaknesses they may have been trained on different databases so there's it really is kind of certainly a wild west situation that we're in um so i know a lot of you are teaching in the classroom now, you know, you're starting your semester as teachers, a lot of you are also working in this administrative and strategy role. But what we're going to ask you to do now, and we'll have the online group probably do, Nabila, does it make sense to do one online group? Because we're going to do small group, a small group. And then, or we could do small breakout rooms, I guess. I um, and so what I'll ask the in-person audience to do is, discuss these two questions for about, we do about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and we will be, um, I'll be walking around and kind of listening to what you guys are talking about. Um, and Dr. Moss will do the same thing in the online. And so the questions are, um, what are some discipline specific ways that are, that are relevant to your discipline that you can use to support students' sense of the realness um, that acronym of AI to advance equality and equity. And then also, can we think of specific examples or assignments where you might be able to engage students? And some of you have already created these. So I think these are interesting because it gives us a chance to learn from how, how each other have already been strategizing around this. So we will ask you to break into small groups of folks sitting near you of uh, roughly, um, let's do groups of four to five if you can, or if you end up with three, that's okay too. Um, and we'll go for about, I think we can do 25 minutes, but if folks are winding down in 20, then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it back to the whole group to share out. Questions? 
Jennifer, do you mind putting up the action? Oh, yeah. So, and, and use the action to get the whole slide. I
Yeah, thank you so much. I don't, know if all, I don't know if you all had as much fun as we had online, but um, we would love to give folks around the room an opportunity to just share out. We don't have much time, but we'd love to hear how you are thinking about this as you enter back into your fashion spaces, into your workspaces. How are you thinking about this? I know we left with a lot of unanswered questions, um, but at some point we know that we'll get them answered as an institution. But would love to hear uh, three to four people share out what you're thinking about as you go back into your classroom space. Um, how might you use these tools? How might you talk about this with students around the opportunities and challenges associated with each of them? Uh, but yeah, I want to open the floor to you all to be able to debrief what you talked about uh, in your private spaces. Kelly. One of the things that, uh, that we talked about, we sort of ended here, but um, I'm talking about authenticity. Um, if you can sort of frame AI as a, uh, as a tool, and the individual student needs to sort of be aware of their authenticity and how AI can be, you know, a tool where they can do some thinking and get some feedback of a kind. Um, but ultimately, we need to know that they are doing work themselves, they're doing thinking themselves, and they're being authentic in that way. Um, we all reminisced about how lousy it is to try to teach your own students. <laughs> if you can get students in a, in a room and actually look them in the eye and get them talking about what they're doing, what they're doing what they're interacting with, is you actually have to sort of do the reductive thing and give them a grade eventually. So you can take a focus off the of, uh, finished product and put a focus on the interaction and get them to sort of talk and be authentic. That's really good. I love, I love that idea of authenticity. Other thoughts that people, oh, sorry, I felt it. I'm handing it back to you. <laughs> No, Jennifer, move in the way that you need to. All is well here. <laughs> oh, you want me to call? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't see. Yeah, you can't see people. Um, other thoughts that emerge. Oh, Zach, you say? No, apologies. Oh. I was just. Oh yeah, please. Thank you. Um, so we had a very interesting conversation. And I think because I'm too, uh, uh, was paired with two uh, data folks, statisticians, it got real technical. <laughs> um, and so I, I was listening, I was asking a lot of questions, but it, it's interesting. I think the, the takeaway here is inputs, right? This is something that could exponentially grow. And I think just being really mindful about the sorts of questions and data that the, the system is getting and, and being mindful of that. I think, you know, for Walter's point, I think there's a lot of, you know, his viewpoint that there's a lot of positivity to that. The more data uh, this particular tool gets from our classrooms, from our students, uh, the better it becomes, right? The, I think the analogy we use is an elephant, right? So we all touch one piece of elephant, we don't know it, it's an elephant until like we see that bigger picture 
And AI right now is just touching different parts of the elephant. And so the more we use it, the more we interact with it, uh, the better it could become and potentially be less biased uh, than, than we are, which we are very biased. So I think that was a good point, Walter, to, to, to make. Um, so this is kind of the, the elements. But I also feel like we just need to double down on what makes us human as well. You know, the, the caring, the community, it, all those aspects, I think, then become just uh, so much more powerful in this age. So I think kind of the two combined, using it, but also doubling down on, the, on what makes us so uh, wonderfully human as well. Yeah, I want to jump in here. Um, we, we actually walked across a tension bridge in our discussion that I think the university will have to walk across. And it would behoove us to start thinking about what are our own thoughts around it is, you know, in the event that, you know, a professor is deeply committed to ensuring that students are prepared for the future and believe that a student should be using AI for an assignment and a student refuses to actually use AI as part of a core assignment, given this larger wave or this concern around AI. And then we turn around and we layer that on top of um, how costly it is to buy enterprise versions of all these systems, right? So if faculty starts requiring students to use these, these generative AI tools, it's, it's gonna become an issue of access because I think Hannah was talking about how expensive it is to purchase an enterprise license for these kinds of systems. So we started this conversation today talking about equity and access. We kind of landed in that place, right? As we start getting more familiar with these things and wanna use them more, what does it mean for access for students and what does it mean for students to reject these kinds of systems and what are the kinds of policies uh, what are the kinds of policies that are we, we're going to need to put in place to ensure there are protections for those students um, in the university system so i just wanted to uplift that because i thought it was a very good conversation yeah thank you for that Can I expand a little on, on that conversation with the conversation we were having around privacy? Right? Because when I think about asking students to use these tools, one of the things we need to ask about is who ultimately owns the data or who ultimately has access to the data. And I think there's a big difference between licensing a software that you can run on your local system so that you retain ownership of your data versus it's quote unquote free, but the price you're paying is your data, is your knowledge. And so then the free system is digesting your information and, and you are paying with that since you don't have the cash, right? And so what, what are we asking students to do? And when are we using the tools? And are we thinking through privacy? So right, if you're using it as a research tool, I'm doing confidential interviews and recording those interviews. If I'm going to upload those to an AI system that generates the transcript, did I violate the privacy of the person I interviewed? Yes. Because I know, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but I don't know that we're having those conversations as much as we should, so much as we're getting excited about what the tool can do for us. And so if, if we're not talking about privacy, we're not being real. That's a great point, Olivia. It does segue so directly to Felton's point in the discussion online. Let's see, we have, uh, we have time for one or two more comments. I love um, A couple of things that came up, well, we had a great discussion. A couple of things uh, was also related to, to input and to, uh, and to how to work on a process that rather than what we get as an output, how to work with a student to how to think about things, how to be critical about the information that they receive in the later sense that comes from, uh, from uh, AI. But the other big factor that we were talking about was from the accessibility uh, standpoint. And I was given an example of how we use it in our office this semester, for example, to generate graphic descriptions of images, for example, for students who do not access uh, images, whether because of processing related disabilities or sensory, uh, and, and how the accuracy of that process 
because of the type of input that we, uh, of the type of prompt that we gave the, um, uh, the tool, our accuracy, for example, went from a four to a seven or eight by the end of the semester in terms of, of the results that we wanted and how that made access to information uh, um, available to students who otherwise would have had it in terms of That that makes our makes lives easier, but we as educators have to think, and this came up in a lot of the groups about what do we really want students to know and be able to do in the world. And sometimes those are things that they can delegate as long as they have a general sense of what is needed and how to interact with the tool. They can delegate that to a tool, just like we delegate a lot of math when we write code in Stata or R. We delegate the math so we don't have to do it longhand. But knowing how to knowing how to tell the tools what to do well and knowing when we really have to do some ourselves to leverage our comparative advantage, as Libby said, and as Bob said in this group of being human. That's the hard work for us as educators. And so Dr. Moss and I really want to thank you guys for engaging in this conversation with us today. Thank you so much for getting here bright and early on a sunny Friday. And enjoy your time.